Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all this morning, and especially if you're a visitor, to remind you that during the offering we pass a friendship registration pad. We hope that you'll sign it so that we can follow up and give you another welcome. Are there any special announcements before we begin? From anybody? Tara doesn't seem to be here. She usually has one. This morning, it's my special pleasure to welcome Reverend Dr. Mihi Kim Court to Columbus and to our pulpit. Mihi will be preaching and leading our service as Felipe and his family are on vacation. Mihi Kim Court is an ordained Presbyterian minister, having served in ministry since 2005 to children, youth, families, college students, and young adults. She's currently a PhD student in religious studies, as well as an associate instructor at IU Bleed. An author of several published books, Reverend Kim Cork is also a freelance writer and blogger. Later this year, Mihi will be a keynote speaker and workshop moderator at the Princeton Theological Seminary's Women in Ministry Conference. She currently lives in Bloomington with her family. You'll find more information, and it's fascinating, in your bulletin. It's long. Please read it after the sermon. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you for coming. extra piece of paper than I It's time to please stand if you're able for the call to worship. We gather to worship God our creator. You made us to your image, O God. We open our eyes to see you in each human being. We hear God's call to live in community. O oh, Jesus, be our guide in this journey.
us open our hearts to God in confession. Please join me as we pray. We confess, merciful God, that sometimes when we ask you a question, we get so uncomfortable with your answers. Called to love you with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, we cling to what else they claim on us. Called to love others as ourselves, we limit our risk in living out that kind of love. Forgive us, Lord. Refocus us on you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from God's glorious power. May you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Lord, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. God has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Invite the children up for a time with children. Sit down here so you guys can see me. Good morning. So, I am wondering who was able to attend Bible school this year that happened a few weeks ago. Lots of you were. Do you guys remember what the theme of Bible school was? What did we ask almost every day? And it was on all the signs. What was it? Who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Who is my neighbor, right? And we talked about a lot about who our neighbors are and how we would treat our neighbors. And it kind of made me think of a story. And so I'm wondering if any of you guys know who this guy is. Does anyone know who this guy is? Is he's an elephant? Sarah, do you know? Who is it? That's right, it's Horton. Does, has anyone read the book, Horton, Here's a Who? Yeah, or maybe you've seen the movie. Both are really good. Tell your mom and dad to check them out for you at the library. So let's talk about Horton. So if anyone remembers, Horton he heard a who, but where did he hear it? He, it from a tiny speck that lived on a, a clover flower. So see right here, Horton's holding the clover flower in his hand. And I think we have another picture and you can barely see the speck, but it's at the top. And what did Horton, 
It is pink. It, it, this, is, this is the movie. He caught it on a clover. And what did Horton need to do for the Who's? Do you remember? Did he feel like they were safe? He, did he want to bring them somewhere safer? So the book is about him taking the Who's to, to a place that's safe. Did everyone, all of Horton's friends think that he should be spending time doing this? No. Because they thought, what is the point? It's a tiny little speck. And there's a pretty famous saying in the story, and it, does anyone know what it is? You can read it if you see it. What is it, Evan? A person's a person no matter. A person's a person no matter how small. So you know what that made me think of? Was who was your neighbor? Because what is the thing that God wants to do most? If we could really remember Bible school, what did God want us to do most for our neighbor? What was the most important thing we can do? Anyone remember? What is it? Love God and love your neighbor. Love. That's right. He wants us to love our neighbor. And who does God say our neighbor is? Who are our neighbors? Everyone. That's right. Everyone is our neighbor, no matter how big or how small. And are they close or are they far? Our neighbor, they're both, right? To God, our neighbors are everyone in the whole world, even across the world. And so that kind of made me think, even people who live far, far away, that's right. So kind of like, um, I think Horton can help us remember what God was telling us too, because a person is a person no matter how small or far away or how different. So I have some pictures of some of our different neighbors. So this is all of us all around the world, right? All of our friends. And sometimes our neighbors look a little bit different than us or they act a little bit different than us. Maybe they eat different food than us, but they're all our neighbors. Look at this neighbor. Where's this person sleeping? Are they outside or inside? Yeah, well, a lot of times we think of our neighbors having houses, right? Some of our neighbors don't live in houses, they live outside. And so all of these people are our neighbors, right? And even him. Even him, so even our neighbors that don't have homes, maybe we need to love them even more because they need lots of extra help and lots of care, right? That's right, at, at Lent time we collect money for people who need things. So, so when we are trying to remember who our neighbors are and what we need to do, we just remember what God said and what's the most important thing we do? For our neighbors? Love God and love your neighbor. So we can think of God and we can think of Horton when we're trying to remember that, right? So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for our neighbors and for teaching us to love everyone, no matter how big or how small or near or far or same or different we seem. Amen. And if you are kindergarten or younger, you can go ahead and go to child care. Um, everyone else can take a seat with your family for the rest of church. I do want to make one quick announcement to the congregation. Uh, we are searching for two child care workers. Um, the requirements for that job are that they, you have to be 18 years or older. It does pay $15 an hour. So if you know anyone who fits um, the requirement of 18 years or older and would be good working with kids, we do, um, it's about 9.15 to 9 to 12.15 every Sunday that we would ask them to be here. Um, so please pass the word because word of mouth tends to historically have worked better than advertising in the paper and that type of thing for our workers. If you know someone who's going to turn 18 in a couple of months, we're, we want to know that. So, um, you know, please help us pass the word. Um, this is going to become very important in the next few weeks because Sunday school is going to start and we do need at least three child care workers along with volunteers to make um, our Sundays run smoothly. Um, in the meantime, if you are willing to help on Sundays, we really, 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 really need help. So please find me if you're willing to volunteer. We don't expect you to do it every Sunday, but if everyone could chip in at least one, that would really fill the need until we can get these people hired. So thank you.
first scripture passage comes to us from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Listen for the word of the Lord. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, Grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of god this you learned from epaphras our beloved fellow servant he is a faithful minister of christ on your behalf he has made known to us your love in the spirit for this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption forgiveness of sins. Here ends the first reading.
invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. This morning we are hearing from the gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Listen again for God's word. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, you've given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But then a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. When he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please join me in a moment of prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, it is truly a joy to be with you all this morning. I've heard many, many wonderful things about the FPCC community from both Felipe and my husband, Andy Court, who is the pastor at First Presbyterian Church down in Bloomington. And he has spent some time with Felipe since he began his tenure here. Since you all are only a 45 minute drive from us in Bloomington, your congregation truly does feel like a neighbor, a good neighbor. In fact, my oldest son, Desmond, is even playing in a baseball tournament this morning somewhere here in Columbus. <laughs> which is convenient since I have to go and pick him up. <laughs> like a good neighbor. So I won't sing the familiar jingle. Do you remember that State Farm insurance commercial? Dun, 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 dun. It's, it's very actually difficult to sing. It's a weird melody. <laughs> I won't sing that because it ends up being a bit of an earworm. And I don't want to be the cause of any discomfort or potential conflict <laughs> in your families later on today. But we're returning to the Good Samaritan. And I understand that you heard a good word on it last week at the end of a wonderful week of VBS in terms of neighborhoods and systems that we often perpetuate, which in turn prevent us from being that good neighbor as modeled by the Good Samaritan. I appreciate the children's sermon again this morning. Every week I appreciate the children's sermon. I always feel like, actually, I don't need to preach anymore. We could probably just go home at this point. So thank you for that good word and that good reminder. We're obviously not going to do that. <laughs> The Revised Common Lectionary has us reading it again today. And I honestly can't think of a parable that I love more. So I have an icon at home from the Teze community. The Teze uh, community is composed of more than 100 brothers from Catholic and Protestant and Orthodox traditions who originate from about 30 countries across the world. It's located in the south of France. 
It has become a site of pilgrimage for young and old who come from all around the world to stay for a week, joining the brothers in this rhythm of uh, daily prayer services and Bible studies and basically just taking care of the camp. It's like camp for, for young adults and, and older folks as well. So the year I visited, the brothers commissioned this icon. Uh, it was inspired by the focus of their community that year, which was on the theme of the courage of mercy. And it depicts the parable of the Good Samaritan in these sort of six small circular panels around the image of Christ, which is central. And the panels go through the story. The two robbers' hands, the two religious leaders who are praying with eyes upward, standing above the man now lying on the ground, the Samaritan picking up the man to place him on his donkey, the Samaritan carrying him into the inn, the Samaritan caring for the man's wounds, and then the final image, which is of the characters, the Samaritan, the now restored man, and a third, presumably the innkeeper, gathered around a table. And it's always that last panel that catches my eye as it reminds me of another icon, the one of the Trinity. The Trinity icon and that last panel both have three people sitting around a table with two people, their two heads on the right, tilted towards the third. And there's a large bowl or a chalice in the middle of the table. And it strikes me then that there's a deliberate connection between the restoration of a human being to the community and then to the very communal nature of the triune God. It is a glimpse of the kingdom in that when we pursue with courage, with hope, with joy, when we pursue mercy to its end, it will always result in the full restoration of every single human being to the wider human community. And that is a glimpse of the triune God. And so in the Good Samaritan parable before us today, I want to highlight in particular the ways in which it is framed around the question, who is my neighbor? As that is offered and asked by the lawyer. This is actually a question that's always implicitly present throughout the scriptures from old to new, whether it is about the preparation for the Passover or parables about the presence of God's kingdom. This question isn't only about who we are a neighbor to or who is a neighbor to us. The way it is asked here by the lawyer is in effect somewhat antagonistic and even rhetorical. He's testing Jesus. He's asking, as the scripture tells us, in order to justify himself. And then Jesus, rather than playing his game, rather than launching into a legalistic or an interpretive debate, or even into something that would embarrass or shut the lawyer down, he offers him this story. He offers the lawyer another angle another approach to that question, another possibility, another way in. And he gives the lawyer a chance then to respond to the question himself in the end. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who had the courage to show him mercy. What the parable gives us then is a challenge to keep pushing the boundaries of how we understand reality. It invites us to ask, what is happening, not only in front of us, but on the periphery of our vision? What are we seeing? What are the questions we are asking? Why are we asking them? What conversations are we entering into as a community? And then ultimately, what does it mean to live in this world together. It is recognizing that we have systems and institutions that have created the conditions in our society that permit these daily tragedies from which we are desensitized. The killing of black and brown bodies, to the displacement of people all around the world, to the continuous marginalization of LGBTQ lives, to the mind-boggling income inequities in this country. And that the church, 
If it is truly the church of the living Christ, the liberty of Christ must constantly ask how it can stand in the gap between the present and the possibility. Asking who is my neighbor is a way of continuously working out and waking up to the people around us and drawing near in the same way the Samaritan drew near to the man, in the same way God draws near to us, God draws near to us over and over in the most unexpected ways, in the least likely places and faces, maybe in ditches or roads or even on freeways, maybe on the other side of fences, of walls, of cages, asking, who is my neighbor means to live like we belong to each other, to live like we need each other because we do. Asking who is my neighbor looks like choosing hope, choosing mercy, and then choosing to love harder, love stubbornly, love persistently, so that neighbor looks more like kinfolk and family. We continue in the season of Pentecost. I grew up in a Korean immigrant church in Colorado Springs where the grown-ups, my parents' generation, the first generation, worshiped together. And then my generation, the second generation, we struggled and muddled through Korean and mostly English speaking. We gathered together in the basement that doubled as the fellowship hall. And there we were led in a scaled down worship service by an old white lady. She wasn't a random lady off the street. Our congregation rented space in a dying white Presbyterian church. And she was the wife and widow of the former pastor of that church. And she loved our church and was so committed to our understanding of our Presbyterian heritage she taught us the familiar songs of our liturgy, the doxology, and the Gloria Patri. And after the prayer of confession sometimes where we sing, Lord, have mercy upon us together and open each time. In fact, with the reciting, the first question and answer of the Westminster Shorter Catechism every week, what is the purpose of man? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Their non-inclusive language. I remember the first time she taught us about Pentecost. She explained, it is the church's birthday. And led us to sing happy birthday to the church. And ever since, this was how I understood Pentecost. I imagined the fire of the Holy Spirit coming down and all the people standing around like so many candles on a birthday cake. Everyone lit up. Everyone lit, <laughs> which isn't too terribly far off from that text account of the witnesses to this event, which reads, if you remember, Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. In other words, is everyone drunk? No, it's not even noon, which is probably one of my favorite lines in the Bible. Maybe my second after the resurrection. <laughs> but I digress a little bit. Except that Pentecost was not a one-time event. It is something that is ever before us. And it seemed at that time that Pentecost was this big, happy party, festive, streamers and balloons, food and drink, and the exchange of stories and memories. But no, actually, that first Pentecost wasn't that way at all. It was actually kind of a dumpster fire. It was chaos. It was a ripping a rending of the present reality and what was possible. It was messy and dissonant, but it was persistent. It is persistent. A reminder of the early church in between, in flux, instrumentalized in a particular way, in a way that we might be able to participate, in a way that we might be able to share the gospel across boundaries, across lines, across walls. Because when people are called out to community, it's actually be meant to be more collision 
than easy cooperation. And so Pentecost continues. Contrary to traditional interpretations of this redemption of the Babel story, it is resistance against the homogenizing effect of monolingual colonialistic projects. It is resistance against anything that denies the beauty of difference. It is resistance against easy black and white answers that think the solution can be found by putting people in cages. So remember, Peter quotes a prophecy from Joel and Pentecost. All flesh, boys and girls, young and old, free and slaves, whether they be women or men, are graced with the Spirit's direct connection to the prophecies, those visions, those dreams of God. And what does this mean? I got this answer from Austin Seminary professor Margaret Amer. She says, Peter refers to a community full of visionaries and dreamers. He is not the only one equipped to make meaning. That work belongs to all who receive the Spirit, both then and now. Our churchly Pentecost observances fail if they create nostalgia instead of equipping interpreters or prophets. We are meant to be interpreters and prophets and makers of parables and storytellers, those who glean from the stuff of our lives to share about God's kingdom. This is something to ponder after another week of violence and death all around the world and as we anticipate the ice raids in major cities all across this country. Who is my neighbor is the question embedded in Pentecost, the question embedded in the church that has come out of Pentecost, the kind of reality we are to live out as a church because again, it's not a one-time event that we recognize once a year with sentimental, uh, nostalgic visions, but it is something that we are now. It's a rupture in the systematic ordering of skin color and bodies based on the white supremacist structures all around us. It is a response then to the question of how revelation and relationship go hand in hand and how we encounter the revelation of God in one another, in vulnerability, in mutuality, in ambiguity sometimes. And then again, in the breaking of boundaries and the breaking of bread together, that holy anointing of one another. And so if there's anything I believe about following the Christ, the Christ of the triune God, it means that we keep showing up where there's hurt. This is the moment of Pentecost, this being called out into the streets, this making space for that wild child of the Trinity. Thank you. This telling <laughs> of the God's greatest saving story, even when we don't understand, even when we are guilty or complicit or fragile or confused, even when it doesn't make sense, even when we are despairing, we go out. We show up to be with people, to pray, to light candles, to hold hands, to chant Black Lives Matter, to prophesy, to speak beauty and goodness, to share God's grace, to shout, yes, Lord, here I am, to whisper, Christ, have mercy. In the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen.
continue in our service of worship by joining together in prayer, lifting up both the joys and the concerns of our lives. We lift up and pray for Donna Brand, who asks for prayers for healing and recovery from respiratory distress and pneumonia. And we continue to lift up prayers for those listed in your bulletin, for Craig, for Sarah, for Nathaniel and Ryan Dismore, for Micah and Liam, for Deborah, for Jenny, for Suzanne, and then for neighbor congregations, First Presbyterian Church of Scottsburg. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, you know our wounds, our troubles, and our needs, even before we know them ourselves. As a Samaritan showed compassion to the wounded traveler, you offer mercy to us. And so we pray for those who are sick or in trouble. Comfort them with your grace and empower your church to minister to them. We pray for all who suffer the violence of human hands or the tragedy of nat natural disaster. Shield them with your love. Motivate the church to care for them. God, we pray for children and the defenseless. Safeguard them in your protection and strengthen the church to tend to them. We pray for elected officials and civil servants. Stir them to heed justice and rouse the church to hold them to accountability. We pray for pastors, for teachers and musicians and all the saints who lead your church. Inspire them by your Holy Spirit and guide the church to encourage them. God of compassion, receive our prayers and lead us all to serve in love through Christ our Lord who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for
in Christ, go forth now with the courage of mercy and the spirit of Pentecost, giving you the kingdom of God in your very lives. And may the love of God, the creator, redeemer, sustainer, be with you now and always. Amen.